Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on the Early Intervention Rule for System of Payments. This is Lori Myers and I'm the Early Intervention Training Coordinator. I also have with me our content expert for today, Tracy Cassie, who is the EI Resource Manager. Today will be part one of our system of payments discussion where we'll talk about requirements for all families. And then in part two, which is on Thursday, we'll talk about requirements when a system of payments provider is involved. So our goal for today is to just review some changes to the rule. Um, we didn't receive any questions in advance, but feel free to submit questions during the session today. We won't be answering them today, but we'll research the answers for you and we'll respond in an FAQ that will be posted to our website. So feel free to type in any questions that you have as we're going along. In order to do that um, and to type in any other comments, you're gonna be using the chat box or the questions box on your dashboard. And we will collect your questions for that future response. You can also type in any comments if you're having trouble with the technology, if you have an audio or video issue, um, please let us know and we'll troubleshoot and try to figure out how we can fix those problems. We will also be using a couple of polls today. So when it's time for a poll, uh, there will be a question that pops up on your screen with the possible answers, and you can click the button next to the answer that you want to choose. And those answers will all be anonymous, but we will be able to see a percentage of people who selected each answer. We're also um, providing CPDUs for today's session, so the way we're going to handle that today is we will ask you to sign in at the end of the webinar, and you'll just type in your name, your county, and your role in the chat box or the questions box. And if you are watching as a group, also include the names of all participants. And then the certificates have been uploaded into your handout section of the dashboard. So you'll be able to access that yourself. And then I'll give you a code to enter on the certificate. And I'll be repeating all of these instructions at the end too for anybody who's still logging in or just missed um, part of it. We also included a couple other items in the handout section. The first one is the PowerPoint slides. So if you like to use those to follow along, please feel free to print those or download those to your computer. And we also have a course evaluation in that uh, same handout section. So at the end, we'll ask you to please complete the evaluation and send that to Shaquilla, who is our administrative assistant. And I'm gonna type in her email for you in the uh, chat box, and she will take care of um, tracking all of those evaluations. All right, so before we get into the information about the rule, we just wanted to remind you about where you can find information if you're looking for more resources about system of payments. And that would be under this yellow providers tab on the web page. Um, the website is ohioearlyintervention.org. And then just go to the providers tab. And then you'll see a title, a tile, excuse me, um, entitled system of payments. So that's what you're looking for. And then when you get there, you'll see you have these options, system of payment training and guidance, one that's for prospective EI service providers, and one that's for service coordinators. So if you can bear with me for a moment, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the website so I can show you some of the resources that are available there. All right, so the yellow providers tab, and then you scroll down to system of payments. And then if you go to training and guidance, we have some of the PowerPoints that we used in the past um, when we were initially training on this rule. So there's one called Navigating Ohio System of Payments, and it's a um, kind of condensed version of the original presentation, and then we have the whole presentation. Um, we also have one on navigating the first 45 days, and then some um, other resources that we used back in 2017. This is the service providers section, so it's going to give you information about <clears throat> provider contracts and submitting claims and things like that. 
And then the service coordinator section, that's where you can find um, the parent brochure. There's a flow chart that shows the different activities in the system of payments process um, and a couple of other helpful resources. And we will be updating all of these that need updating in accordance with the new rule. So the ones that are there currently have to do with current rule. And then as of July 1st, those will be updated. All right. So we wanted to start off with a poll because we have heard that sometimes people are struggling with talking to families about this whole issue of their finances, their income, and their insurance. So we wanted to ask you to answer this question, how comfortable do you feel talking with families about their income and insurance? Are you very comfortable, somewhat comfortable, or not comfortable at all? So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. We'll give you a few seconds to respond to that. All right, we have 67% of people have voted, so I'm just going to give you a few more seconds. All right, so I'm going to close that poll and we're actually going to wait until later in the presentation to give you the results. So it's kind of a mystery suspense thing um, because we're gonna do a little activity with that later. So thank you very much for answering that. And we're gonna go on to another brief activity. So now that we've asked you about how comfortable you feel talking to families, we wanted to know if anyone had any sort of go-to phrases or statements or sentences that you use when you're bringing up this issue. So if you are someone that answered that you feel pretty comfortable or very comfortable, maybe you have some helpful tips that you can share with your peers. So please feel free to use your chat box or your questions box and um, go ahead and type in any of those go-to phrases that you might be using. And we'll give you a few minutes to do that. All right, thank you for sharing those. Um, we're gonna come back to those later also. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on. All right, so just a reminder of why system of payments is an important part of early intervention. Basically, the system of payments is the umbrella and the funnel of how services for families eligible for early intervention are paid. So it encompasses all of the available funding sources and it ensures that all families are able to access early intervention services regardless of their income or where they live in the state. So as the rule explains, um, system of payments establishes a structure to pay for activities and expenses that are reasonable and necessary for implementing Ohio's early intervention program for eligible children and their families. And at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Tracy, and she's gonna to talk to you more about um, some of the changes and important key points in the rule. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Lori said, my name is Tracy. I am the early intervention resource coordinator. Um, and I, um, I pretty much do the system of payments. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of review some of the definitions um, in the rule. Most of the definitions have not changed from the previous rule. 
Um, let's review the clarifications and changes to some of the definitions. Definition for assistive technology does not include a medical device that is surgically implanted, such as cochlear implants or G-tubes, nor the equipment needed to maintain those devices. The term early intervention service coordinator reaffirms that a service coordinator um, in a system must be credentialed by the department. And early intervention services includes the reference of the new EI rule 5123-10-02 and refers to the 18 early intervention services that are to be reviewed and offered if needed to eligible EI families. Um, in the section of the website that Lori showed you earlier, under the provider tab, um, in system of payment with the information for um, early intervention polar provider is a list of all 18 early intervention services and their federal definitions. Okay, Lori. The definition of extraordinary medical expenses means non-reimbursable costs paid during the IFSP year by the family of the eligible child for medically necessary care, health insurance premiums, co-payments and deductibles, and modifications to the child's home to make the home accessible. We are briefly reviewing the definition of the EME. But in part two, we will go into more detail about how to track the EMEs and when they come into play during the process. The term medically necessary care has been added to the definition of EME. So let's take a look at that definition of what medically necessary care. So medically necessary care is defined as a procedure, item, or service that prevents, diagnoses, evaluates, corrects, ameliorates, or treats an adverse health condition such as an illness, injury, disease, or its symptoms, emotional or behavioral dysfunction, intellectual deficit, cognitive impairment, or developmental disability, and that meets generally accepted standards of medical practice, is clinically appropriate in its type, frequency, extent, duration, and delivery setting, is appropriate to the adverse health condition for which it is provided and is expected to desired outcome, is the lowest call oh, sorry, is the lowest cost alternative that effectively addresses and treats the medical problem, provides unique, essential, and appropriate information if it is used for a diagnostic purpose, and is not provided primarily for the economic benefit of the provider nor the convenience of the provider or anyone other than the recipient. So these Tracy. Are these yes. Sorry. Um I got a couple comments asking if you can speak a little bit louder or move um, move the microphone closer, maybe. Just having a little trouble hearing you. Okay. Let's try this. If this does not work, Lori, then I'll switch over to the phone. Okay. So basically, this definition of medically necessary care um, is is very long, um, and and has a lot of information in it. Um, I think the easiest way to break this down is that um, that it's it's a needed procedure. Um, so if we're looking at um, um, procedures that are not needed to meet any of these criteria, 
um, then it cannot be necessary and cannot be part of the EME. Is that better? If you can let Lori know in the chat box if if, if you can hear me better. Okay, we're going to move on now to... Tracy, uh, sorry. They said not much. It's not changing too much. Okay. All right. I'll tell you what. Give me two seconds. I'm going to switch okay. over to a phone call. Okay. Okay. Hello, can you hear me now? That is much better on my end, so we'll see okay. if that works. Yes. All I'm right. Getting, yeah. Okay. Very good. Sorry. Very sorry about that. Okay, Lori, we'll go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, section three. Um, section C or three of the rule explains the provision of and the payment for early intervention services. So there are six early intervention services and functions that are provided at no cost to eligible families and children. This should be very familiar um, to everyone. These services are child find, evaluation and assessment, service coordination, activities related to the IFSP development, and procedural safeguards. And then the newest one that we added um, with, with the SOP rule was the 55 units of early intervention services per the plan span, which is identified um, and needed in the IFSP. So these are the six activities that are provided to families at no cost. Uh, C2 of the rule lists the five sources that should be reviewed as possible funding sources for the early intervention services that were just identified. Um, these resources are county boards, private insurance, public insurance, parent cost participation, and the department. So for any early intervention service that is identified and put on your IFSP grid, as a service coordinator, you need to be looking at these five funding sources and determine which one um, is best for paying for your early intervention services. So when determining which funding sources are available to the family, the system of payment forms EI-15, which is a determination of the parent ability to pay for early intervention services, EI-16, the payment for early intervention services, and EI-05, the consent to use insurance for early intervention services should be used. We will be discussing EI-16, 17, and 18 in more detail during part two. Um, the new forms will be available on July 1st, 2019 on the Early Intervention website. Okay, so um, up to 55 units of the Early Intervention Services are available to every eligible family and child regardless of the family's ability or inability to pay. When the first 55 units of services are not available or denied by the funding sources previously discussed, county board, private insurance, or public insurance, then the department shall pay qualified personnel 
to provide the services identified on the IFSP regardless of the family's ability to pay. When more than 55 units of early intervention services are identified as needed, a parent identified as able to pay for early intervention services shall be responsible for paying the cost of early intervention services, whereas a parent identified as unable to pay for early intervention services shall continue to receive the early intervention services at public expense. Providers of early intervention services other than the county board shall enter into a contractual relationship with the department and become a polar provider so that the department can pay them. Tracy, now, I, yes. Um, if you don't mind, can we back up to the previous mm -hmm. um, slide? I got a few people asking if you could repeat the five um, funding sources. Sure. So the five funding sources are your county boards, and that includes your Title 20 and um, levy dollars and, and however your county boards are um, paying for the early intervention services. Private insurance, and that that is the family's private insurance, Aetna, um, Oh my goodness, I'm like medical mutual, um, the, those type of insurances. Um, public insurance, which is your Medicaid. Parent cost participation, which is parent out of pocket. And then the department, which is the polar funding. So those are your five funding sources that need to be looked at. And if you connect that to the next slide, Lori, you will see that the, um, uh-oh, oh no. That's all right. There it is. Just doing something <laughs> weird. There we go. <laughs> You would see that um, for the first 55 units of services, we are looking at only four of the funding sources because remember, we're not going to look at the parent cost or the parent self-pay because every family, uh, regardless of their income being determined able or unable to pay, is going to receive 55 hours that will be either paid for by the county board, the private insurance, their public insurance, or polar. How are we doing with that? Did, is that any clearer? I think we're doing well. I don't see okay. any other questions. Okay, super. All right, we can go on to the next one then. So this is um, this is the new form. This is EI15. Uh, this form replaces 1701 page one, and this is uh, determining the um, family's ability to pay for their early intervention services. So the early intervention service coordinator shall explain this rule, the system of payment rule and determine a parent's ability to pay for early intervention services using form EI-15. And you need to do this within 45 calendar days of the parent's initial contact with the early intervention program and within 45 cal calendar days of each scheduled annual review of the individualized family service plan. A parent shall be determined able to pay for early intervention services unless the parent is receiving WIC, has a medical card, or the family's income is less than or equal to that required for Ohio Healthy Start eligibility for uninsured children. 
Now, this can be found on the Early Intervention website under the Provider tab. We will have um, the chart that used to be on this form um, available to you on the website um, so that you can determine if the family's income falls equal to or less um, than the 206% of the federal poverty level. Um, so just real quickly, on this form, Medicaid or WIC or the parent's income needs to be um, marked in order to determine that the family is unable to pay. Um, you need to sign it after um, you determine if the family is unable to pay, and then the parent signs it, which basically acknowledges that they have been informed if they have been determined able or unable to pay. So I think we are ready for um, another poll question. All right, so this one is a little bit longer, and when I typed it into the poll feature, it only lets you put in so many characters. So <laughs> I'm going to read you the whole question, because then you'll see it, the shortened version in a moment. Okay, so it's a true or false question. As an early intervention service coordinator, I can have the family initial the statement, I have chosen not to share my financial information and understand that according to OAC 5123-1003-D, I will be responsible for paying the cost of early intervention services beyond the first publicly funded 55 units. So you can have the family initial that statement if the family is using county board services or won't come close to the 55 hours of EI services in their IFSP plan span. And this won't affect the family during later participation in EI. Okay, so think about that for a moment, whether that's true or false. And then I will go ahead and put the poll up. All right, we have about half of you have voted, so I'm going to give you a few more seconds. All right, take a few more seconds to vote. Hmm. All right. All right, so I think we're going to close the poll, and then Tracy's going to talk about this a little bit more and then see if it may or may not change your answer. Okay, so um, uh, do you want me to give the answer, Lori? Um, it's up to you, however you want to do it. All right, let, let's let's talk about this first. Um, so what happens if a parent chooses not to share their financial uh, information? A parent can choose not to share their financial information if they do not have a Medicaid card or receive WIC. The Early Intervention Service Coordinator should ensure that the parent understands that they will be determined unable to pay for their early intervention services after the utilization of the first 55 units. All right, Tracy, the, did you mean uh -huh. able to pay? That they would be determined able to pay? Yes, they I will think be you determined. Said unable. Um, I'm sorry. They will be determined able to pay for their early intervention services if they check that box. The early intervention service coordinator shall inform the parent that he or she is able to request a redetermination of ability to pay if the parent's financial situation changes after the initial determination. It is a parent's rights violation 
if we do not give the parent a choice of whether or not to share financial information. So the answer to the poll is it is false. And the reason that the answer is false is because checking that box that they are able to pay could have an effect or will affect the family as they possibly move through the early intervention um, process. Um, and here are some situations where this could be a problem. If the family moves um, from one county to another, um, being determined able to pay um, could affect them. If their income changes or they get a new diagnosis that increases services that the county board cannot provide, uh, for example, if the the child gets an autism diagnosis and um, an increase in services or ABA services is needed, um, the family, um, just by checking that box, um, is determined able to pay and um, when in fact they may not be. And, um, and I think this is really, really an important thing to, to remember that 206% is a fairly high number. And there, um, there are a lot of families that are very surprised that once we determine what their gross income is, um, that they fall under that 206% and can be determined unable to pay. Um, so making sure that, that we, you know, we fully figure this out and we go through the form and um, we're just not jumping to checking that box because it's easier, because the family doesn't have their pay stubs right then and there, um, or making the assumption that we're just going to use county board services so it really doesn't matter. Um, moving one county, just jumping right over the county line, can make a huge difference for some families because not every early intervention program in the state provides what some early intervention programs provide. So in other words, um, County A may have a complete core team that can provide the services needed for that family, but they jump over the county line and County B does not have a core team, or they have a core team without the ability to provide at the frequency and duration that's needed um, for that family's outcome. So, um, so it is a disservice to our early intervention families if we are not walking them through this process um, and taking a look at their, their income. Now, with that being said, the family can still choose not to share their income, but at least you have laid out the big picture for them and they are making an informed decision as to whether or not they want to share their income versus just checking it because of ease. Okay. I know Lori's scanning through the questions a little bit. We're going to let that sink in a little bit and see if we need any clarification on that. Yes. Do you want to share what the um, poll results yes. are? Yes. Yes. Uh, go ahead, because I'm not sure where to look for it. Okay, so we had um, we had sixty two percent that answered true for that, and thirty eight percent false. Okay, and I'm reading some of the comments, and um, 
And a lot of the comments are saying, you know, I, I mark true because we can always go back and redo the form. Um, the family, you know, if, if we get into a situation, we can go back and revisit. And and that is true. You can. But my question back to you about that is why do you want to do double work? So, you know, I hear from the service coordinators, you know, we, I have a huge caseload and I have a lot of, inf you know, there's a lot of paperwork to do and, you know, with the reviews and, 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 you know, everything that's going on, why, why make yourself go back and do something if you can do it um, and get the information up front the first time? Um, so it, you are correct. You can go back at any time and redo this, this paperwork. But again, why do it if you don't have to do it? Um, so, um, so that, and you, I, I guess it's frustrating for me because you're really walking the line of a parent's rights violation. Um, because if they do not understand what they are signing and, um, and, or they realize after the fact that all you had to do was figure out this income beforehand and I could have been determined unable to pay up front, you're walking that line of a parent's rights violation and it's just, um, it, it it's just a, sticky wicket uh, that you just have to be very careful about. Um, but the the bottom line is this. If a parent signs or, or initials on this new form that they are not going to share their income, you as a service coordinator need to be on top of their services and their situation um, hot and steady on this, especially if the family is planning or not even planning, if the family moves out of the county, um, they have to understand what the the scenarios could be by being determined able to pay because they're not sharing their information. Um, so I go back to the poll question. The poll question is false because by checking that box, it does affect the family in the long term while they are receiving early intervention services. So um, we will leave it at that. Um, and we'll go to the next slide, Lori. So here, here is the parent cost participation. When a parent is unable to pay, an eligible child shall be provided all early intervention services identified as needed in the IFSP, including those early intervention services that exceed 55 units or hours per individualized family service plan year at no cost to the child or the family. When a parent is determined able to pay, the parent shall be responsible for paying the cost of early intervention services, including private insurance, co-payments and deductibles needed to meet the outcomes in the individualized family service plan. Now this excludes the early intervention services and functions mentioned earlier that are at no cost to all families when the services exceed 55 units per individualized family service plan year. So basically, if a family is determined able to pay by EI-15, once they exceed 55 units, they are responsible for the cost of their early intervention services. Now, a parent shall not be charged more than the actual cost of the early intervention service, and if they have private or public insurance, shall not be, to char shall not be charged disproportionately more than a parent without insurance.
early intervention program shall not use the private insurance of a child or parent to pay for early intervention services without written consent of the parent obtained using form EIO-5, which is our consent to use insurance for early intervention services. Prior to getting the consent, the early intervention service coordinator shall provide the parent with a system of payment brochure, explain the rule, explain that there are potential costs with using their insurance, and suggest that the parent reviews their coverage and contact the insurer if they have any questions. When using private insurance, the Early Intervention Service Coordinator shall obtain parental consent with Form EIO-5 prior to an increase in the amount, duration, or scope of early intervention services specified in the IFSP. Every review of the IFSP needs a review and a new signature on EI05. When using private insurance, the Early Intervention Program, or DOD, shall pay the cost of co-payments and deductibles using the payer of last resort funds as necessary for the first 55 units of the Early Intervention Services per the IFSP year and for the additional units of early intervention services when a parent is determined unable to pay. The early intervention program shall not pay the cost of private insurance premiums. And when a child is covered by both private and public insurance, the use of private insurance is required prior to the use of the public insurance to pay for the early intervention services. Okay, so let's look at how this all goes on um, the form. Tracy, uh -huh. um, we got a couple questions that I thought you might want to clarify about um, some things that you just went over. Okay. Okay, um, let me scroll back up to these. Okay, so first of all, do all the IFS or all the reviews of EI05, do those all have to be in person? Um, so it depends. So if, if you get, uh, the family consents and then the family calls you and says, oh my goodness, um, after talking with my husband or talking with my wife and, um, talking more with our HR and stuff like that, we kind of decided we want to change our mind and we don't want to bill our insurance. Um, that type of a situation, um, no, you can just send it to the family, email it or whatever, and they can, they can make the change, sign a new form and send it back to you. Um, if you are reviewing the IFSP, then yes, you will be there in person and, um, you will need to get a new form signed, uh, with every review of the IFSP. So it just kind of depends on the situation and the conversations that you have with the family. Okay, so a similar um, question is, is EI05 reviewed with an IFSP review, not just initial and annual? That is correct. Now let's talk about real quickly why. When you are changing services on the IFSP, that affects the use or the the informed decision that the family needs to make as to whether they want their insurance to continue covering it or they want to stop using their insurance. Um, the situation could change. So, um, so with every review, when you are increasing or decreasing services or removing services, you need to review the EO, EI05 and, um, and, and obtain a new signature and a new consent with what the family wants to do with their insurance with that review. Okay. 
we do have some other questions, but I think we will defer those to the FAQ and just um, move on. Does that sound okay, Tracy? Um, yeah, yeah, that's okay. fine. Okay. But we are gathering all of your questions and um, we'll definitely respond to those. Um, okay, so let's look at the form. So this is EIO5. This form replaces 1701 page two. Um, and the early intervention program shall not require a child or a parent to enroll in public insurance programs as a condition of receiving early intervention services but um, shall share information about the enrollment process for such programs. Um, but so just kind of park that for a minute because I wanna I wanna kind of look at this form with the um, with the private insurance to kind of um, end the discussion about private insurance. So when you are completing um, EIO five and the family has private insurance. They do not have public insurance. They have private insurance. The family is going to check, yes, bill my insurance, or no, do not bill my insurance. If they check, yes, bill my insurance, then you are going to gather their insurance information. Um, you do not need a copy of the card you are just going to write down the numbers, their start date, the company, the insurance company, um, and then the parent's going to sign it, okay? So they are signing co their consent to yes, and they're giving us the information. If they say no, do not bill my insurance, you do not need any information, but the parent still needs to sign, okay? And then you need to jump down to the use of public insurance and they have to mark my child does not have Medicaid insurance and they have to sign that. So on EI05, you are going to have, um, if the family has private insurance, you are going to mark yes or no with a signature and then you are going to mark no, my child does not have medical Medicaid and a signature. So every EI05 will have two signatures on the form. Okay. If the family does not have private insurance, then they will mark I do not have private insurance and, and they will sign it. So one of those three boxes in the use of private insurance needs to be marked with every family with a signature. Okay. Now moving on to the public insurance. Um, again, we are not requiring a child or a parent to enroll in public insurance. Um, and the early intervention program shall not enroll a child or parent in public insurance, or use the public insurance of a child or parent to pay for early intervention services if the child or parent is not already enrolled in the public insurance. Now, we can give them information and we can um, help coordinate um, that, that connection um, to um, to have the family enroll, but we are not requiring the family um, um, to enroll in, in Medicaid if they do not have insurance. Now, the intent of this form has not changed. Um, w this is a consent form. Um, we, do need, um, we do need the consents. With the public insurance, um, the early intervention program shall provide written notification to the parent, which includes that the child's PII, personal identifying information, will be disclosed to the public insurance program for billing purposes, 
that the parent has the right at any time to withdraw consent, that the parent will not be charged co-payments, deductibles, or premiums for using public insurance, and that children covered by both public and private insurance must use their private insurance first in order to access their public insurance. Your written notification also includes that the parent will not, as a result of using public insurance for early intervention services, have to pay for services otherwise covered by public insurance, incur any premiums or discontinuation of their public insurance for the child or parent, risk any loss of eligibility for the child or the parent for a home and community-based services Medicaid waiver component based on aggregate health-related expenditures or risks, decrease in available lifetime coverage at any other insured benefits, and of course, the procedural safeguards. Now, there is no need to um, get upset about getting this written notification and how am I going to do this, um, and is there a form that we're gonna be giving them um, because all the information that you need to um, give to the parents um, is provided in the System of Payments Parent Brochure. So all these written notifications that you must inform the family and give the family is all in that um, System of Payments Parent Brochure. And you documenting in your case notes that shows that the parent was given the system of payments brochure and that you reviewed it with the family will satisfy this part of the rule of, of providing written notification to the family. Okay, um, when using public insurance to pay for early intervention services, the early intervention service coordinator will obtain an initial one-time parent consent for the disclosure of the child's personally identifiable information, or PII, to the public insurance program for billing purposes using EIO-5, which is, again, is a consent um, to use insurance for early intervention services. So let's look at EIO-5, and what we're going to do is we're, we're now talking about a family that has public insurance. They do not have private insurance. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the family mark, I do not have private insurance at the top, in that top section, and then they're going to sign that they do not have private insurance. Then you're gonna go down to the use of public insurance, and the family is either going to mark yes, bill my Medicaid, or no, don't bill my Medicaid because I don't want my, my public or my, my personal identifying information to be provided to anybody. And then they're going to sign. If they mark yes, you need to get their Medicaid number and you need to write down their Medicaid number. So when a family has public insurance, they are marking, no, I do not have private insurance and signing, and then they are either consenting yes or no to the release of their information. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And then you are getting another parent signature. So again, you will have two signatures on this form and there will be at least one box marked on each section for every family um, um, that you are working with. <laughs> now, if a family does not have private insurance and does not have Medicaid, they don't have any insurance at all, then you just mark those appropriate boxes, have the family sign twice, and, and you're good, you're good to go. Again, if a family has both private and public and they want to use the Medicaid, they have to consent yes to their private. If they mark no on their private, then they have to mark no on their public. 
you you it's it's all or nothing um with um with the insurance now the family could choose to use their private insurance and not their their public insurance they can choose that but it can't be the other way if they want to use the public insurance they must use their private insurance Okay, Lori, do we have any questions on this? Because I know insurance has always been a stickler over the past past couple years. Um, we do have a few questions, Tracy. Um, okay. So, okay, so this one, um, is it correct that if the parent gives consent for public insurance, the payment would be polar and then Medicaid? Uh, no, it's the other way. So, well, the the um, Medicaid would be billed um, because the family is consenting to that. If there's anything left from the Medicaid, which there would not be, then um, Polar would be billed. Okay. Um, and then a question from Patty. She asks, doesn't Medicaid coverage only make a family unable to pay? Why would they want to share their Medicaid number? Because, um, because uh, federal IDA law states that families need to be given the opportunity to consent to use their insurance or not. So you so what we're talking about here we've got two separate issues. Medicaid is if a family has Medicaid then you are determining that family unable to pay. But then the family has the right to consent to use or not use their insurance as one of the five one of the five funding sources. So if a family has Medicaid, they must be given that opportunity to consent to use their insurance. And then they can choose, yes, go ahead and bill my Medicaid for these services. And if they say bill my Medicaid for these services, then we need the billing number so that we can bill the Medicaid. Or they could say, no, don't bill my Medicaid, and then you don't need their, their number. Um, so you, you have to be sure to give the family their right to consent to either using their insurance or not as one of those five funding sources that need to be considered um, to pay for the early intervention services. The family has been determined unable to pay. Early intervention services are at no cost to families that have been determined unable to pay. They are not free. And this is a really important distinction here because somebody has to pay for those early intervention services. If the early, inter if the early intervention services were free, then you all as service coordinators would be volunteering your time because it's free. Nobody's paying for anything. It's a free service. But as we all know, that is not the case. It is at no cost to the family. Something is paying for it, and it is one of those five or six funding sources and the sixth one would be the family, um, the family self-pay um, after the first 55 units. So somebody is paying for those services, and it could be insurance if the family consents to using their insurance, either public or private. I hope that answered her question. Thank you. All right, so there's another question from uh, Shelly, and she wants to know, do you fill out both sections of EI-05 if the Medicaid is a managed care plan? Yes. You're going to fill out both sections um, um, either way. You, you need to have a box or whatever. Um, Medicaid, Medicaid, yeah, it's still Medicaid. 
So, mm. you know what, Lori, mark that question. Let's let's double check for sure, and we will we will check. But off the top of my head, I'm thinking even though it's a managed care, it's still Medicaid. So I believe it would still be the public insurance, but I am not sure. We will we will double check that. Okay. And I think we do have some other questions, but I think we'll table those for now and move on in the um, interest of time. Okay. Does that sound good? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So I think we have a couple questions here um, that came in before, right? Is that what we're looking at? Yeah, these actually came in um, in regard to the rule webinar that, or I'm sorry, the forms webinar that we had last week. But because okay. they were about system of payment forms, we thought we would review them here as well. Okay. So we did and answer think, them last week, but we're going to answer them again. Yeah, and I think I, I think I just answered them, but we'll quickly go through them again. Yeah, I, I just tend to ramble. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, all right, so the first question is, will there always be two parent signatures on the form, one on each half of the page? And yes, um, there will be um, always two signatures. Um, there will be a box checked on both sections and signatures on both sections. Um, and I think I answered that second question there with that as well. So the third question, where can we access instructions for completion of this form? Currently, right now, there is guidance um, on the Early Intervention website. Um, so where Lori showed you um, where to go in the guidance section, so it would be the top on the left-hand side, the very top section um, for SOP guidance documents, there is a guidance document on how to complete um, 1701. Um, that is on the website. Um, and we will be updating, actually, I just saw a draft uh, yesterday. We will be updating that guidance document to reflect EI-15 and EI-05. So there will be um, instructions on the website under the Provider tab, System of Payment, um, Guidance Documents uh, for you to, to kind of help you walk through these forms. Okay. So, I think we are going to go back and revisit our polls. Yes, we are. So, at the beginning, you answered the question about how comfortable you feel talking to families about issues of income and financial um, situations and insurance. And we had 16% um, of you said you felt very comfortable discussing that. 57% said somewhat comfortable and 27% not comfortable. So kind of a range. Okay. Um, but most people were in the, you know, sort of comfortable and not so comfortable okay. area. So then we asked if you would share any suggestions you have for how you discuss and have these conversations with families. So we did get a few comments about that, and I will share those now. All right, so um, Clea said, she says, I'll note your gross income if you are comfortable sharing that information. If not, we can check this box, which indicates you are able to pay for services beyond the 55 units if we get to that point. Okay. Okay. And then Tammy um, said she, she tells them if you don't feel comfortable with sharing your income, you can check that box and we can revisit this form again if necessary, which we kind of talked about with our discussion mm -hmm. earlier. Um, Bethany 
said, she says, we're required to review other insurance, and I assure you services will continue, and I will be here to help each step of the way. Okay. And then Kristen says she tells them that sharing your financials is optional. If you choose to share your financial information with us, it allows us to determine if you're able or unable to pay based on your income. If you're able to pay, it will help us determine what your cost share will be before you are determined unable to pay. Okay, which is important, and we will talk more about that on Thursday. Um, Okay. Okay. And we have a comment from Sarah. She said she starts the conversation by describing the rule, and then she says we have to collect a lot of information, and one includes information about your insurance and income. I know this is not always comfortable. Then she explains the option, and she always reminds them that they have a choice. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Good. And then I think we have one more from Erin. She said she likes to make sure families feel comfortable, so she lets them know why it's important and that it is their right to share as little or as much information as they want to. Good, good. Any other ones? I think that was all of them, Tracy. Okay. I think I think it's important um when you are talking with families to um to let them know that every single family is determined able to pay. We you are under the assumption that every family is able to pay. But by completing the EI-15, you are trying to determine that the family is unable to pay. So I think that's a that's a that's a huge mind shift um, with with families because um, because I I wouldn't I wouldn't be you know I'm going to make the assumption that I'm able to pay too. But I've never really been given at all every social service agency that I may have well I know that I've worked for and that I you know um may be wanting access to programs or whatever they they are always trying to say that I make too much money. Our mindset is is kind of the opposite. Our mindset is we know that you're able to pay. We're going to use this form to see if you are unable to pay. So by, you know, do you have a Medicaid card? Do you have a WIC card? Uh, Those are the automatics. And then let's just check your income. Let's just, let's just take a look at your income. Let me figure out your income and, um, and, and see if you are unable to pay for your early intervention services. And and in this conversation with the family, you're 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 like, hey, if if we can pay for these services 100%, let's let's see if we can do that, um, rather than yeah, the family just making that assumption, yeah, I'm over income, because I I I see your um, I see your currently 1701s when they are coming in um, for the polar funding. And there are a lot of families that are um, that are unable to pay, um, and the the notes that I get from the service coordinators and the emails is this surprised us. This absolutely surprised us. Um, the other thing that 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 I kind of want you to think about as you're explaining this to families is this is part of your assessment of the family. Um, Income and resources and availability of insurance and and things along those lines. This is, these are questions through your family assessment and through your child assessment that you're getting information about this family. So if you have a family that is assuming that they are over income and you are able to determine that they are unable to pay because they fall under that 206%, 
they may also be eligible for other services like WIC. Um, they, you know, they may be able to get other additional supports that they may need that they think that they, they're not going to qualify for. So this is, you know, just jumping to county board services or you're not going to go over your 55 so you don't need to worry about it. I'm going back to that poll question. This does affect the families. This could affect the families in a um, in a positive way, either accessing services or identifying um, possible services on their IFSP to help them meet an um, an outcome. So, just you know, think about your practice and think about you know how you can use um, this information. Um, as you are developing the IFSP. Tracy? Yes? I wanted to share another comment um, that Robin just typed in. Um, she says she is comfortable with discussing these issues, so she wanted to share what she usually says to the families. And she lets parents know at the first visit that by the third visit, we'll be reviewing their ability to pay above the 55 units. And if they want to share their income, then have their income information available at that third visit. So that way they have time to prepare um, if they choose to. And she said, as service coordinators, we're doing intake and income verification as part of the job. If I'm comfortable about it, then they will be most of the time. Exactly. Um, it, it's it's, and I and I know that asking about income and and such is, is uncomfortable. But like I said, if you can think about um, the purpose of the form, uh, the intent of the form, and what we're trying to do with that form. Um, and and explain that to the family. Our our purpose is not to determine that that family is able to pay. Our purpose is to um, see if that family can be determined unable to pay. And when you guys come back on Thursday and we start talking about the EME again, that is that that's another way that we are trying to help the family become unable to pay so that their early intervention services are paid for. It's a completely different mindset than most of of the social services and accessing services and things along those lines. So, um, you know, um, Robin has the, um, has a, um, has the ability in how her county provides um, service coordination that she's got three visits to work with the family and talk with the family about this. I know many of you are doing all of this in one visit and um, and that's you know that's where you need to you know talk with your team and talk with your supervisor and and just see how all of this and what this conversation looks like um, and um, and how it fits into your process. Um, but, um, but it, it is important, um, that the family understands. And at the end of the day, if the family understands all that goes along with initialing that they do not want to share their information, then so be it. That is fine. Um, but it is your duty and job as a service coordinator to make sure that that family understands the big picture of um, of what it's going to look like as they travel through um, their early intervention experience. Um, and again, that includes diagnoses that may come in. That includes possibly needing services outside of the county board, which you should be looking at. Um, that that could mean the family's moving to another part of the state that possibly that county doesn't have the same services available to them and what that means for that family. And um, and again, as long as the families are making informed decisions, then you should be okay. Okay. 
Um, Tracy, we did get a question about something you said earlier. I think you said EI-15 replaces 1701. Did you mean 1702? No. EI-15, which is a determination of the family's um, ability or inability to pay, replaces 1701, page 1. EI05 replaces 1701, page 2. Got it. Okay. okay. 17, yeah, 1702 is still 1702. Um, that form number is EI16. And we will be talking about 16, 17, and 18 um, in our next call. And that their equivalence is 1702, 1703, and 1704. Um, and I know it's a little confusing. Lori, I actually have a slide from a previous training that I did that we can add to Thursday's presentation that has the translation of the okay. form. That'd be great. So so we can add that for you guys on Thursday. See now, see I'm making you come back on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we, we will make that um, slide available in the presentation on Thursday so that you can see the translation of the form numbers. Okay, great. And then I just wanted to respond. Um, someone had a question about whether we can share your peer comments, and I think we can do that on the FAQ. Does that sound okay with you, Tracy? Um, yeah, or what I was thinking, um, um, what I was thinking, I think we may have a similar question um, because I liked how this turned out. Um, maybe we can add a similar question on well, how we explain the EME and everything to families. And maybe we can just um, create a brand new document of peer suggestions or something. But yeah, we will definitely get uh, these peer suggestions out to everybody. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, if if you still feel like you are on the fence with this or you are in the I am really not comfortable with this at all um, and you want additional assistance, please contact your program consultant, um, talk with your supervisor, um, contact your program consultant and we can schedule a technical assistance call with me um, to kind of help um, walk you through wherever you may be stuck, wherever you may feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I, I will be more than willing to, to provide that TA with you. Okay. So we have one, one more section that we need to look at um, with this rule, which is our procedural safeguards. Um, and this is section H of the rule. Um, a parent contesting the determination of the ability to pay or the imposition of a parent cost participation shall be afforded the procedural safeguards set forth in Part C and Rule 5123-10-01 of the Administrative Code, including mediation, state complaint procedures, and due process hearing procedures. In addition, a parent contesting the determination of the parent's ability to pay or the imposition of a co parent cost participation may request an informal review by the department. Early intervention services shall not be delayed or denied to an eligible child of a parent determined unable to pay for early intervention services in accordance with paragraph D2 of this rule. So this is where I was talking about that, you know, making sure that the parent has been given the, the SOP parent's rights brochure um, and that you have walked them through this rule. Um, you have walked through all the forms. You have given them all the information that they need to make, the informed decisions that they need to make. Um, and if at any time 
the parent feels like um, something has gone askew or they don't agree with your determination, um, they have um, they have the right to um, contest and question through the procedural safeguards rule. So um, always make sure that, that they know where that information is. And again, this all this information that we talked about today is in that parent's uh, SOP brochure. So Lori, that is pretty much all that I have. Um, I will be going through and looking at all the questions that have come in and putting together an FAQ for that. So I think I'm going to turn it right back over to you. All right. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for submitting all your questions. As Tracy mentioned, we will be answering them in an FAQ, and it's been taking us a couple of weeks to get through those and answer all the questions, but then they will be posted on the website, and that will be under the new tile, which is called Early Intervention Rules 2019, and that's in the Providers tab. We also want to remind you, we do have two more rule webinars coming up in our series. So as Tracy talked about earlier, part two of the system of payments rule is going to be this Thursday, June 13th at 8.30. And then the last one is on the IFSP form, and that'll be next week, June 18th. And if you haven't registered already, the links for registration are in that same tile, the EI Rules 2019. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and review the certificate instruction.